Hello, everybody. Good morning, Wikimania. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Sean, and this is a panel about uh, AI and uh, challenges and opportunities that that presents to the movement, and particularly uh, specific projects that the foundation chapters and others are conducting, uh, so practical kinds of concerns. There is going to be a panel in about an hour or so, an hour and 15 minutes, uh, where they'll be talking about sort of more philosophical and kind of vision ideas around what AI means more broadly. This will be a sort of more specific panel about what it is that's actually going on on the ground in terms of products and features and uh, concerns. Uh, so I have three great panelists. Uh, you, can, you all can introduce yourselves, maybe. Hi, I'm Danny Vranicic. I work, um, I've been Wikipedian for 20 years now, and I have worked on Wikidata previously, and now working on Wiki functions in AppSec Wikipedia. Hi, I'm Lydia Fincher. I'm the portfolio lead for Wikidata, and have been with Wikimedia, and specifically Wikidata, for 11 years now. Uh, my name is Leila Zia. I'm the head of research at the Wikimedia Foundation. For those of you who may not know about the research team, it's a team that focuses on building models and insights, utilizing scientific methods, um, and also strengthening the research community around the Wikimedia projects. I bring to this panel some of the perspectives uh, anchored in the work of the team with regards to generative uh, AI and large language models, as well as some of the work that we are doing with the neighboring teams in the Wikimedia Foundation, um, and share with you some of the per perspectives and work that is happening at the moment. And I am Sean Spaulding. I'm uh, lead counsel at uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. So on the legal team, I, I interface a lot with the future audiences team that's thinking about AI. I do some product counseling with other teams, and so that's the perspective that Uh, I think that so many of the topics that we're going to talk about, we could talk about for an entire hour. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know in advance, we're going to be making a handful of simplifications. So when it's not necessarily always going to be straightforward, whether or not we're talking about machine learning or other concepts like that, but we're going to use that term. And uh, one more thing, we don't represent everything that's going on in the movement. So. Uh, if anyone is specifically working on anything, then feel free to basically raise your hand and talk about it, because uh, our perspective is just one of many perspectives going on here. Finally, you all, m many of you came here from a long ways away, and so we don't want this to be a lecture necessarily, so as soon as anybody has a set of questions, feel free to raise your hand and present those questions so we can uh, interact together. All right, so uh, there is one kind of preamble that I'd like to give, which is talking about how the use of AI is not necessarily new to the movement, new to the foundation or its products. Uh, and so uh, let's talk about that. Uh, we've been using bots since the beginning. Uh, there's been a machine learning team since 2017 at the foundation uh, doing things like machine translation. And so maybe everyone can start out by saying, uh, how have these tools that we've been creating uh, evolved over time? And how have they currently sort of met the project's needs so far? Um, sure, I can start. Um, I'll maybe say that if you're interested in the topic of getting an overview of the many tools and technologies that are currently being developed, I encourage you to attend a session at 12.15 in the plenary hall. Santosh, who is sitting in the back of the room, he's, or middle of the room, sorry, um, he's uh, run, um, running that session, so you will get a deeper view into what's happening on the projects with regards to machine learning and AI. Um, uh, I can share a few maybe examples of things that have been happening in the Wikimedia Foundation. For those of you who are interested you know, in uh, bringing newcomers, new editors to the movement, some of you are familiar with the Newcomer Dashboard. It's a dashboard that is developed by the growth team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And part of the dashboard centers um, around this idea that we, we should 
engage newcomers by giving them structured tasks because we are sometimes giving them too many things at once and it's not clear to them what they should be working on. So the growth team worked with the machine learning team and the research team at the foundation and we developed a um, machine learning model which is called Add a Link, giving an existing Wikipedia article, the technology or the algorithm recommends to you what hyperlink can be added to an already existing article. Right? So it's an example of machine learning uh, being used at the foundation in the products and features that some of the users interact with. The feature is available now in more than 100 languages and you know, there's more work being done on making the model more language agnostic. And this is something that I want to emphasize on. I think we are going as an organization through some level of transformation as we realize what are the constraints that we are working with. We used to develop machine learning models for specific languages. And now we are realizing that we have 300 plus languages just in Wikipedia and there are other Wikimedia projects that we serve. So we are moving more and more towards where it makes sense, lang language agnostic models that allow us to go to many more languages uh, at once. There are other examples like revision scoring and quality scoring of the articles. This is a piece of technology that was developed in 2017 and 2018 under the umbre umbrella of ORIS. We are revisiting that technology right now because we understand that we need to go to many more languages much faster than what we're going to. And it, the process is slow because we need to build training models in every language that we go to. So again, for that piece of technology, we are looking at language agnostic models. So there is a model right now that does revision scoring in 47 languages. Um, and we are testing in more languages. So a uh, lot of the evolution right now, or part of the evolution, is around thinking about language agnostic models in ways that we can scale to more languages more quickly. So great example. Anyone else have any examples of current <laughs> kinds of uses of AI? Uh, one thing that I want to mention is uh, what Sean already said, that um, we've been using technology that is AI like since the very beginning. One funny thing about the term AI is that AI is usually whatever we don't really understand right now. <laughs> um, and um, for example, technology like using templates with, with, with um, places to put in words, mm -hmm. things that, are called, that were called mail merge, were totally de uh, developed within AI projects back then. And we would never think of AI uh, today uh, as being that. But this is how, for example, Rambot took the US census data and put the city uh, data in 2003 or whatever into Wikipedia. And this is like 20 years ago. Um, so we've been using AI results since basically the very beginning in Wikipedia. And today's AI is a continuation of that. And I'm pretty sure that we will absorb this just as well as we did before. And uh, we have, what, what I think is much more important is that we can do so without losing sight of what's really the valuable part of Wikipedia. What is the special thing that we do? And um, we're going to have a more philosophical session later, but, um, um, but I just want to point out, this is nothing that is like entirely new to us. We have been dealing with new technologies over the last two decades all the time. Okay, so great examples of stuff that's currently been done historically, but I think everybody's here because they understand that, oh, AI now means uh, large language models and diffusion models. And so what is being currently proposed or already worked on uh, that might be using those techniques? Um, maybe I can start. <laughs> um, for, for Wikidata, there are several ideas that people are throwing around and some of them uh, people are actually working on. Um, so for example, when you want to use the data in Wikidata and um, really explore it, um, you probably need to know um, Sparkle to write a query. Um, that is hard, uh, too hard for a lot of people and um, is a barrier that maybe shouldn't exist. Uh, so people have been playing around with uh, training a large language model to take a, a natural language prompt, like uh, give me the 10 biggest cities um, and uh, translate that into a Sparkle query. Um, results look promising, but not quite there yet. <laughs> Um, another thing I'm very excited about, but that unfortunately uh, people haven't started working on yet, uh, if you want to, talk to me, uh, is uh, using a large language model to basically take some data from Wikidata, um, like um, 
um, the date of death of a recently deceased person. We have a reference to an obituary in the New York Times, for example. And then we could use a, New York, uh, a large language model to uh, prompt it and ask, like, does this um, reference we have here actually say uh, that this person uh, died on that date? Or is that maybe not the case and someone should look at it and, and correct the reference? Um, yeah. One place we're looking and uh, abstract Wikipedia project is, so in abstract Wikipedia you will need to construct the articles um, in a natural language independent way, which um, requires probably quite some involvement, learning like to which constructors are there, how to pull them together and so on. And this is a place where, already since the project has been proposed three years ago, we were thinking that we can use an LLM to, uh, the word LLM didn't exist back then, that we can use a language model to basically look at natural language input and try to create constructors itself, basically translate it into that so that it gets you a head start into building the content of abstract Wikipedia and helping you there, but leaving you in complete control of the content because you are the one who actually then says, yes, this is right, or I can go in and edit it more. Um, maybe I'll start by sharing what if uh, Mariana Pinchuk was with us, so she is on the panel, but she couldn't connect um, because it's too late in San Francisco. So I'll speak a little bit to some of the initiatives that they're running in the foundation first. Um, so the foundation decided to invest on what is called future audiences as part of the annual plan. You may have read this as part of the annual plan of the organization. Um, there, uh, I, I must emphasize that there are a lot of discussions happening right now. So it is uh, by no means uh, we can claim that you know we know the answer to everything, but we, it is clear to us that we need to continue learning, listening, and experimenting with the communities, for the communities, and also for the audiences that may not be here today with us on the M Wikimedia projects, or we may lose them in, in the coming years. So the Future Audiences uh, initiatives is partly focusing on initiatives that is going to focus on bringing new users to the Wikimedia projects. And uh, one of the things that you may have read about um, is um, the, chat, the Wikipedia ChatGPT plugin. It's a plugin that you can access if you go to ChatGPT. Um, and the what the plugin does is effectively constrains the ChatGPT space and it basically lets you interact with ChatGPT, but only with the Wikipedia data. It's almost like a plugin that, that, can, that can tell you what is Wikipedia's perspective on the question that you as a user are asking. If you have not experimented with it, I, I encourage you to have a look at it, but that's one of the examples of things that the foundation has done over the past couple of months to make sure that we continue evolving and learning and experimenting, and now we are looking at the data to understand how and if we are engaging with new audiences um, in that space. Another relatively large uh, part of our attention um, it in, in this coming year is going to be on the topic of text summarization. We already started with some of the MBART and machine learning models around text summarization. Um, text summarization is a piece of technology that can, if we can get good at it, can have a lot of different applications. Uh, those of you who were in Wikimania in Stockholm, we had a um, community discussion uh, around uh, managing disinformation and mitigating disinformation on the projects. And one of the requests that came from some of you who attended that session was that um, the discussions around perennial sources go for decades. And it's very hard for someone who is entering the discussion on perennial sources sometimes to understand what are the important pieces of information that they need to know from the past two decades of discussions on perennial sources. Of course, editors right now spend time manually summarizing content, but those are the type of applications that we are thinking about, which is where are the places where we can support editors in doing the work that they're doing, but removing some of the burdens that they're going through, right? And of course, text summarization can have other applications, right? You can think about mm, writing the prompt for the articles. You can think about other ways of managing and mitigating disinformation and misinformation. But that's an area that uh, we are investing research and experimental development resources on to understand how we can use text summarization. And I will say the key for text summarization is not the technology, but finding the right applications where it is going to be actually useful for people who are on the ground. So it, it seems like there's so wide of a range. So we talked about Sparkle and interactions with wiki data and wiki functions. We talked about text summarization, uh, the chat GPT plugin. 
uh, in the universe of every single thing that we could possibly <laughs> work on, why are these the things that we've chosen to focus on? Because we want to really focus on what we as the foundation or the, or the chapters can do, basically, um, to, to help the, the contributors, to help, um, to help you when writing Wikipedia. We are completely aware that we are just a little part of the, of the wider research world and of the wider um, product world. There will be a lot of products built on top of Wikipedia, on the top of Wikidata, on top of our projects, outside of what we are doing. And for some of those areas, um, like for example for the future audiences projects with ChatGDP and so on, we are diving in because we want to be able to like see what's going to give a bit of more guidance in what these areas can do, and also to check like how are people interacting with that to, to in order to f to get this kind of data and feedback back. Um, in other areas, we simply don't have the resources to do everything, and we know that there will be other um, organizations outside, universities, companies, and so on, who will be doing a lot of this stuff. So we have to strategically place our that's in the understanding that the wider world is doing also something, and we don't necessarily have to replicate what they will be doing. And we are probably uniquely positioned to understand um, you as a contributor best and to find places where we can really help you with those things, whereas most of the others are more focused on, on readers and bringing the knowledge out to the wider world. So uh, just for anybody who came in recently, uh, we'd like this to be an interactive session. So if anybody's working on anything, feel free to raise your hand and talk about it. If it, oh. Or ask we'll we will repeat the uh, question that you ask as well, if you'd like. It's not about something that I'm working on, but it's a question I would like oh to yeah, pose to the great, panelists. Yeah. So um, I was quite interested to, to learn about the, the move from uh, language-specific models to language-agnostic models. And my question was, I, w I actually had a question that w tied into this, which is how does the, the, the ag language-agnostic representation that we want for abstract Wikipedia tie with these uh, kinds of models and with the claim that uh, some large language models already have some sort of language-agnostic representation? Right, so um, Google's na uh, natural language translation models, for example, since five or six years have this claim that they have some internal mental lease representation of language. Um, I've, I've looked into this quite a bit, and the, the thing is that those things are not exactly human understandable. Um, so using those things as an uh, interface for humans to contribute to text and to, to work with it, I wasn't exactly sure that this would work. Um, so for for abstract Wikipedia, one main thing is that everyone can contribute this content. So, so it must be reasonably understandable how to use it actually, how to apply it, and so on. Um, so, but but the interesting thing is, I think it is easier for an LLM to adapt to our guidance than the other way around. I mean, humans are even smarter; they could figure it out if we really need to. But why should we? Why shouldn't we focus on uh, creating something that's really, really good for us, and we'll get the LLM to train on that one. Then we can produce training data, we can use this to, to guide the LLM and so on. I wouldn't look too much into the mentalities that those models are creating. Those are often highly specific for the individual models, and whatever you learn for the current version of GDTP, uh, GPT that's out there um, is not necessarily anything that is connected with what the Google natural um, uh, model does, for example, and so on. So I would say let's focus on making something that's really good for us, and um, the, the models will catch up. One, one thing that I think is relate, somewhat related, not, not quite entirely related, that I would add from some of the learnings about the ChatGPT plugin is uh, people have been using it all around the world in different languages, and we've been studying the statistics on how much it hallucinates in each different language. And we've come to the conclusion very quickly that it hallucinates way more in certain specific languages than others. And so it's hard to predict even which languages that happens in. And so uh, I think it's kind of important to think very carefully about uh, how to roll these things out, where to roll them out, how we uh, talk about how accurate these things are 
as well before they become sort of robust and universally used products. I did actually the experiment of asking factual questions in different languages to um, the current version of GBT, uh, GBT. And it was interesting to see that it has completely different knowledge bases in the different languages, for example. For, similar things, for, for simple things like what's the birthplace of this person and so on, it will give me different answers depending on which question I ask. Um, and this doesn't bode well for those. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, any other questions before we switch gears to another topic? Uh, the next topic, then, uh, we're talking about the Wikimedia's role in training uh, diffusion models and large language models. And so, uh, I think that everyone is familiar with the idea that when you uh, create one of these, you, it ingests a lot of data and then it connects weights to certain uh, different words and the connections between words. And so how do you get those words? You get them by scraping the internet as well as scraping large data sets like Wikipedia or in terms of images, Wikimedia Commons. And so uh, the projects represent a pretty significant amount of the training data that's used. And uh, it's also sometimes more highly weighted than other training data. And so this clearly presents a lot of opportunities, right, because we are integral in the ecosystem. So maybe we can talk about opportunities and challenges that this may present. Um, yeah, so from the Wikidata perspective, um, I think there is a huge opportunity for improving large language models um, with making more use of the a very structured model knowledge that Wikidata has. Um, so for example, um, when you, when something new happens in the world, uh, something interesting, as we all know, happens every day, uh, very quickly it happens on Wikipedia, very quickly it happens on Wikidata and all of our other projects. Um, and it would be, um, a, in my opinion, a, a very useful thing to improve those large language models by um, taking what Wikidata has as structured data and um, using that as structured data instead of trying to, to learn from it and from a huge amount of text, um, which will take you so long uh, to accumulate for something that just recently happened, for example. Like a recent election, it will take time until there is enough content online and the LLM is retrained to really um, get that again in, in the next training round. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities there to, to improve them. The, there's, one, there's one thing that I'm particularly afraid of. Um, so so the, the, the modern LLM models all have, uh, all have this feature of catastrophic collapse, which means if you start training them on output from LLM models, they actually become suddenly much, much worse. And um, uh, this is kind of an Ouroboros thing, if you're into morphology. Um, and the thing is that, as Sean said, those, those models are all trained on Wikipedia very heavily. Wikipedia is often like rated with a factor of at least two or three or four, even more, in those models because it's such a good data set for answering questions and so on. And therefore, it's also no surprise that these models are really good at spitting out things that look like encyclopedic articles because I mean they've been trained on those specifically. So you might have to think, oh, actually, we don't need Wikipedia anymore. We can all get this thing out of this system. And the results will look really good and very promising until the moment you realize that as soon as you start building an, an ecosystem on that, it will probably collapse catastrophically <laughs> within, within a reasonably short time, within probably half a, uh, half a decade or something like this. But by then, that's enough time, for example, to kill something like Wikipedia. So. I'm afraid of a scenario, basically, where we, <laughs> it's not really this kind of scenario, but still, where we uh, have these AIs coming in and looking like a decent replacement for Wikipedia, reaching even an audience that would uh, surpass ours, cannibalizing all interest in our projects, besides a few hardcore people, basically making us completely um, sidelining us, just in order to then collapse and not giving us the space to, to breathe anymore as a project. And 
I wouldn't have no idea how to avoid this kind of scenario, to be honest. This is obviously outside of what we as, uh, uh, as the foundation can do and so on. But um, so this is one thing that I'm, that I'm really afraid of. And I'll repeat the question, so. So yeah, I um, also thought about this scenario already. And um, my idea is, so in that, in the, and AI is never perfect, I would say. So, um, but Wikipedia is also not perfect. <laughs> but um, the way to make sure that Wikipedia can survive in the time of AI is that Wikipedia will always the better source. So, um, yeah, we still have to improve the quality, the um, the updates, and all the things. So I would say that would be the best way that uh, Wikipedia can survive in a time of AI, and that we should focus on um, that uh, strategy, how to get better always than the AI. <laughs> oh. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Denny, I think what, what the point you're making is excellent, and I was just wondering, um, the same way as uh, some researchers are trying to speed up evolu evolution um, in the laboratory, is there is there a way we could do this uh, for this uh, catastrophic collapse? Um, is there a way that we could simulate um, what would happen if we would go down that route, um, that Wikipedia would stop being uh, improved by volunteers, by people, by readers, um, and that we just start training it on itself and um, show basically to the, to the academic community like that might not be the best path to go down. Okay. Um, I'm very, yes, there is. I mean, it's known that this thing happens already, so there is a way to actually show it. I'm just wondering whether a Silicon Valley startup that creates something like an AIpedia um, would ever care about that or not. <laughs> and if the wider audience would care about using that or not. If it's it feels better at that moment. Um, so even if we show it, even if we prove it conclusively, which wouldn't happen, but even if we give very strong indications, I'm worried that it wouldn't be sufficient to actually avoid the scenario. I, yeah. Oh, I, by the way, when you say uh, when you say something, introduce yourself quickly. I just want you to introduce and then. Uh, yeah, I'm Kevin Goldi. Uh, username is Vikiolo. I'm mainly in writing in German Wikipedia, and uh, yeah, okay, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Lodewijk, uh, Dutch Wikipedia, and uh, currently in California. I think there's there's so much here. So there's there's actually two collapses because there's both the collapse of the quality of the models themselves, which is a problem to companies like OpenAI, where if you poison the database by training it on AI created uh, language, the quality goes down. And then there's the collapse, of course, of uh, Wikipedia and the projects by people moving towards these models rather than moving towards contributing. And I think that the academic community is already pretty clear on the idea that, yes, these models collapse very, very, very quickly when trained with AI uh, content. And so I think that the companies that make these models, I mean, the for-profit companies at least, are paying attention to this pretty heavily. And so this has been the type of conversation that has happened uh, with tentative conversations with AI, open AI that the partnerships teams has, have had. So they recognize this is a problem, whether or not they actually do anything to support the project to fix that problem, it's unclear. Uh, hi, Thomas Shafi, username Evolution and Evolvability uh, from Australia. Um, one of the things with uh, you mentioning the problem that people could start using by default information article, you know, whether it's encyclopedic style information or just you know Google search style information generated by AI instead of going to Wikipedia. To an extent, that's also just a reputation is a huge factor in that. I mean, it's not wildly different to the idea that anyone can fork Wikipedia or mirror Wikipedia. Those typically have way less viewership than Wikipedia itself, partly because Wikipedia has 
the reputation it has for better for worse you know it's an improving reputation and so perhaps the solution may not be fully a technological one part of it has to be the trust the branding the public perception the way that wikipedia presents itself across different formats okay uh, i would like to make uh Okay, uh, my name is Kirill Semenovsky. I'm from the Macedonian Wikipedia, but I'm also active on uh, Wikidata, on Wikimedia Commons, and on the English Wikipedia. Uh, I would like to give a different perspective on this. Uh, I admire the work that you're doing, and I think that uh, the future is in the AI, but uh, the thing with uh, the Wikimedia communities is that uh, we need to use it in the way that it helps a lot of work that uh, volunteers don't want to do. For example, I would uh, prioritize using AI and machine learning techniques, for example, to uh, Wikify pages, to improve uh, the quality in the sense of adding uh, hyperlinks or uh, uh, formatting the text or doing uh, stuff that uh, volunteers usually don't want to do and uh, have a hard time with uh, newbies. Uh, as, uh, far as the generating articles using uh, AI uh, is concerned. I think uh, this is something that uh, volunteers uh, running bots uh, used to do even 15 years ago. For example, you could run a bot to create uh, uh, articles uh, on uh, celestial bodies or villages. And uh, if, you uh, if you write a good script, then even the content of that article would be sufficient uh, beyond the placeholder. So I think uh, at this stage, uh, because uh, we know that uh, uh, contributing as a volunteer is always, is always a joy, and I think that most of the people willing to contribute to the community projects do it because it makes uh, fun for them, and they see it as an opportunity to socialize, to learn, to learn something new. I think uh, the main priority at this stage should be to use AI smartly in a pragmatic way so that uh, people don't, want, don't need to spend time on doing uh, things that uh, uh, they find it hard or not uh, that uh, enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I want to maybe share two things. One immediate follow-up on what you shared. I think your perspective is at least like in good parts of the Wikimedia Foundation is shared. So the priority of attention is not article creation, at least not on our end. If the communities decide to go and do that, that that's fine. And the communities can choose to do that. Uh, but for us, there's a lot of focus on existing communities and how we can support them with this piece of technology, as well as future audiences that we may leave out if we don't think about. So I'll talk about this on Saturday. We now know that in a project like French Wikipedia, 80% of the edits that happen are maintenance related. This is significant amount of edits that are happening in this project as a relatively established project. And the question that we face is how do we support, how do we use this piece of technology plus other pieces of technology that exist to best support the editors who are doing that work on the project because that is key. The other thing I wanna say is uh, on the topic of risk, yes, there is risk and we always you know, geek out about it and talk about it. Um, Mariana in, her, um, in the opening session yesterday talked about uh, what the world needs from us and from Wikimedia. And I will say in the context of AI and this particular conversation, I will say, you all, we all have a place to say, what do we need from the world in order to be able to do the things that we are doing on the projects? So if the ecosystem around us is shrinking, if a lot of projects are deciding to you know, not share their data openly, that is a bad news for the ecosystem that we are in. And we, as a community, need to align, need to have demands, need to have clear demands. And, you know, the foundation is one of the entities that, you know, through partnership or other efforts can support the communities in this way. But there are also other um, entities within the movement. But I think it is important for us to also not feel that this is happening to us. We have a say. We are shaping the knowledge in the world. So, and we may have demands. One perspective from the legal department that although not entirely related to AI, it directly relates to what you're saying is we, during the fiscal year when we're creating what our goals are, one of the most important goals this year has been to help 
existing editors work more efficiently and have more time to do the things that they actually want to do and spend less time in terms of maintenance, content moderation, and things like that. And so I think that a lot of different avenues are being taken, including thinking about developing products, thinking about changing certain user experience things to make it easier for uh, people who are doing a lot of work on the projects already. I'm Heather Ford from Australia. <laughs> Am I from Australia? Um, <laughs> I was wondering about the legal um, aspect, actually. Oh, well, um, maybe segue to that, yeah. Oh, great. Well, um, just going back to Denny's core challenge, which um, I guess is the is the one that we most have to worry about. Are there any plans on um, the foundation um, thinking about enforcing um, the license in any way? Or, and or, I know that you guys are doing a lot of work around AI regulation, mm -hmm. um, but are there plans on trying to um, make some demands to the companies that are using the content, sometimes in explicit explicitly against the um, licenses? Yeah, there are a lot of aspects of that question, and I'd hope to hear from Kat as well, from uh, Creative Commons. Uh, but first, to answer your question directly, uh, number one, there's a really strong tension between the goals of the licenses, which is to broadly disseminate free information with very limited sort of uh, attribution requirements, and then the share alike requirement, which allows it to be shared more broadly. So I think the legal department's current perspective on this is that the licenses do allow for broad uses, including innovative uses like training uh, models. To the extent that there is a tension, there's a very strong tension because it does require attribution. And many of these companies, particularly proprietary companies, don't even talk about what's in their training database. So that is as far as you get from attribution. Some of them that do talk about what's in it don't actually talk about the specifics of what's in it, and they don't talk about who actually created it from like a robust way. And so you can imagine even when some, uh, a company like OpenAI says, we use Wikipedia data, uh, that's not quite enough especially because if DALI is, for example, trained in Wikimedia Commons, it's each individual contributor who is the author who needs to be attributed in a certain way. And I think this sort of shows the broader tension that people have with these models. It's like, to the extent that people wanted to participate in openness, they at least expected in exchange to uh, be rewarded with attribution and also contribute more broadly to everyone getting this knowledge rather than it being locked down. I think the final tension here, which is re really important, is that although the output of many of these LLMs is in the public domain uh, because of the default copyright laws in many jurisdictions, they can contractually uh, prevent these things from going into the public domain by saying, for example, in a terms of use, hey, if you use our thing, then here are these extra problems with it. So again, tension between how they came up with the weights to make this stuff, how they trained it and whether or not they said it, and finally, how they actually treat the output. Uh, there is no current, uh, I mean, there are, so Getty Images, for example, is a good example of a company that has explicitly said, we would like to stop you from doing this, and if not, we'd like to get paid. So that is, that's a perspective that we are almost certainly not going to take. Uh, it's un yeah, Reddit is also another uh, case where they've decided, well, we will shut down your ability to access information unless you pay. Again, not something that I think that anyone in the legal department is interested in going down. It's not a path that we're interested in going down. However, the path of, as an industry as a whole, everyone needs to figure out how to conform with the basic attribution and share alike requirements is going to be really important to us in the future. And I think that we can be a leader in that because we're also so integrated into all of these systems. 
I don't know if Kat has anything to say. Sure. Uh, so, hi, I'm Kat Walsh. I'm the General Counsel at Creative Commons. And uh, as you might guess, we've had a lot of conversations with, with people at Wikimedia uh, and at OpenAI and Stable Diffusion and ba basically everybody interacting uh, with CC licensed material in this space. Uh, and it's uh, one of the things that we struggle with at CC is that the licenses only apply like when you do something that you're required to seek permission for under copyright. Uh, and that's like making a copy, distributing a copy, but what these AI systems are doing is often like not making and distributing a copy. Uh, distributing the training data sets, sure, because that's like distributing the material, but like training on that data, like uh, is that something that is making a copy? Uh, we're he really hesitant to take that position because if you take that position, uh, the implications are like, if you as a human read and study something and you you know write a Wikipedia article from it, like have you made a copy? Do you need permission from that copyright holder? Uh, if you're doing something like that involves a computer, like text and data mining, uh, and you you do research based on that, do you need permission from the copyright holder? Have you made a copy? Uh, so we've got a lot of blog posts at CC, and if you want to hear more from me about what CC is thinking, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, and you can ask me all the spicy questions you would like to. <laughs> uh, but, but in general, we have been hesitant to say that you need it. Uh, and this is totally at odds from how people think about like what, what should deserve attribution, like when should you cite your sources. And I think that the copyright aspect and the like what should you do can be completely separated, uh, that people can cite their sources, can drive traffic back to the source communities like as well as they can, and whether that's connected to copyright licensing in any way, uh, that doesn't have to be. Uh, but just the ways of doing that and how you should do that is a is an open question right now. Okay, uh, I have a question specifically for Leila. Uh, there is a myth that uh, AI is independent from uh, human interactions, which is not true. So we need to make sure that uh, our active editors, our community, is uh, interacting in the right uh, way with uh, the AI that we have on the project. Uh, so uh, did the research team conduct any online uh, experiments in which uh, uh, community members are tested and uh, their, uh, their propensity to work in an AI-supported uh, environment was uh, tested in some way? I'm not aware of research, definitely not in our team, in, in the way that you're proposing it. However, I'm willing to talk with you outside of this room, maybe at lunch or something or afterwards, and then we can I can understand better the question that you're trying to get at, and then we can see if we can create something out of it. Hello, um, I'm Tim and my username is HAB, was the English Wikipedia. Um, I really uh, want to push back a bit on this assertion that Wikipedia is so essential to all the LLMs and that would lead to contact, colla contact sorry, collapse within a few years. So um, it's right that if you look at existing models, right, that open either that we are three or five percent and as often it's weighted more heavily as one of the most reliable part of the data set. There's others, so the foundation actually published a post, I think last month, linking to analysis, which looked at a fine print. It had Wikipedia was the most widely used one, so second most, by the 0.19%. And uh, <clears throat> there was also the um, this New York Times article, which was great overall, uh, which I think many have seen, and this has a quote like, without Wikipedia, there would be no generative AI. And I had a conversation after this with uh, the researcher who has this, uh, Nick Vincent, who actually who did some great studies on how Google relies on us. Um, and I we, we didn't end that it's, so he clarified, he really didn't mean it as a, so it would be impossible to have current LLMs without Wikipedia. It's more like we were there, we were available, right? We, were, we say we put our dumps out there, it's easy to download. So in some sense, Wikipedia was actually a convenient sample. And I mean, I totally get the, that we're highlighting this point, right? I mean, if I was a foundation leader who were doing PR for the foundation, which I did several years ago, I would highlight this, right? Hey, look, look, all these models are using us. But within us, we really need to be clear. This is not a given uh, that we are essential. And the last thing I'll say, there's some interesting research. Um, so basically, uh, people talk, now are talking about this. If you really wanted to find out how much worse would a model be without Wikipedia, it's really hard to do. There's an interesting overview article um, for a workshop last, uh, a conference last month called Gen Law, 
a large machine learning conference, and they say it would be very expensive to find this out. I mean, the foundation could find such an experiment. But before that, we need to be clear on ourselves, at least, that it's not a given, and there's a lot of high-quality data, like textbooks and all these source research sites that are not in a trained data set, in which so far we've always been saying they're more reliable than us. So I really warn about this, patting ourselves too much on the back and being too confident about this. One, one thing I can't necessarily speak from a technical research perspective as to how much or how little we play in terms of making these models work correctly, but what I can say is from a legal perspective, uh, the question about how training works, where training, which countries training can happen in because of copyright laws and other database type laws is extremely real to all of these large companies trying to monetize this. And so to the extent that we are not only a large database, but we're also a large, mostly free database is critical. And so, for example, you might have a situation where lots of textbooks exist, but those textbooks are under owned by publishers and it's unlikely in a race between publishers trying to sue these companies out of existence and them trying to continue using their products. I think that there will be a move towards more freely licensed material being used for training, which again sort of facilitates this idea that we are integral to the process. But from a technical perspective, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think I want to add two things to um, as uh, maybe follow up uh, on Tillman's point. One is that I think it is it is important for us to continue to create spaces where people can call out what they see as potential risks. I think this is a space that is rapidly evolving. It's a disruptive piece of technology or series of technologies that are happening. And it's important for us to have spaces with, without, in which without fear, we can talk about what are the risks that each of us may see in this room for these kinds of technologies and just hear it, process it. Maybe it is, maybe it is not, but let's have the space for having those types of conversations and hearing from one another because the space is moving really fast in terms of advancement. So we need to just continue listening to each other and just hearing each other. And of course, not be afraid of the risks, right? Again, like I, 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 I center us back. I invite you to come back to the place that as Wikimedians over the past two decades, uh, more than two decades, you have built a system in which you're if you have basically a radical system for knowledge governance around the world like that's a big deal that's not you know one edit in one page it's a, it's a model and that model has been evolving for more than two decades and i think it will continue to evolve in the face of this technology um yeah so i mean currently um the uh, ai ai data are mainly from trained from wikipedia but i think in the future um, when it gets broader, when uh, it's more competition, they will use also data directly from the scientific papers and so on. So I'm not sure how long uh, they will need um, Wikipedia in the end. So I see a high danger that um, <laughs> the whole Wikipedia could collapse due to AI. So maybe my question is, because I see it also as a risk that uh, one day a commercial um, company, may, maybe from Elon Musk, um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, have all the control about the knowledge of the world, and um, yeah, maybe is there also are there also thoughts on the foundation about creating an own AI about uh, with all the knowledge um, to get and all the. Um, on that way on, maybe, so to create it from our side already. To, just on your premise before getting to the actual question, um, training an LLM on scientific publications directly, I think that Elsevier and Springer have a certain different view on copyright and how much you can use <laughs> than the foundation does. So I'm not sure that would, that would go very smoothly, to be honest. But it would be very interesting to watch. Yeah, just quick, quickly from yeah from the legal department's perspective, I think that Denny is accurate in terms of yes, they're scientific papers that are absolutely locked down, and these people want to charge large amounts of money, particularly for commercial uses like this that disintermediate them. 
uh, from your perspective, there are many openly licensed scientific articles and more and more every day. I mean, we actually support efforts, right, to <laughs> openly license as many sci uh, scientific articles as possible. And so to the extent that there might be certain use cases that do completely disintermediate certain aspects of Wikipedia, I think that's real. I think from a general perspective, maybe Denny's point is also accurate in terms of to truly generalize the amount of scientific information, for example, in the database, you would need licenses from hundreds, possibly, of different uh, copyright owners. But I would be very entertained watching a lawsuit between OpenAI Microsoft and Elsevier. But <laughs> That's at least as entertaining as a cage match between Musk and um, Zuckerberg. So. But maybe to the point of actually uh, what ideas have been thrown around around creating our own models. Can I speak? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just want to follow up on this. So this is one of the places that there's no decision that has been made. Um, there are discussions, and my team is involved in parts of at least those discussions around whether we should build um, LLM for multi-purpose, basically, not for very specific purposes, but like use this technology to basically build general purpose um, systems for Wikipedia. Um, there's, again, like no decision, there are discussions basically, right? And there are considerations here that we're having that I wanna share. Um, one is the issue of languages. We cannot leave languages behind um, and we cannot further the gap with the actions that we take, at least in significant ways. Like it has to be in coordination with the communities and that is work that is happening on the ground. As was mentioned before, um, these technologies are primarily right now targeting a few top languages. Um, and then the question is, what about the other 300 plus languages that we currently care about and the other 2000 so languages that we wanna to welcome to our projects? So we need to think about that and we need to be intentional about that. It can be that we decide for some languages, for some projects, we will offer certain types of technologies and for some we don't, or we decide we wanna do it for all. But this has to be intentional. It's an intentional choice and we need to look at the trade-offs. The other thing is that we're experimenting with building, basically utilizing LLMs in specific places. Like for example, we, are, we now have models that we're testing on, on um, basically um, predicting the probability that a revision gets reverted using LLM. And we're seeing that these models are quite expensive. They're quite expensive to develop and maintain. And there's a question of how much, I mean, the budget of the foundation is limited, as you all know. And there's a reality about like how much we can utilize this. And we also think about opportunities. There are partners out there, right? Hugging Face is, is a partner. It's like they are in this ecosystem. They're doing tremendous amount of work in the open data, open science world. And we need to also be opportunists. They can look at these partnerships and relationships that we can build and see what is the right thing to do. But I will say that our approach so far has been we need to be intentional. We can't just jump and just do it. Hi, um, Tamsin, Dr. Thaneet from New Zealand. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, my concerns about risk is that um, there will be effects on the wider ecosystem about open licensing. And there already are because I see institutions that openly license things, uh, theses, I work on the New Zealand Thesis Project, things that were previously available, you now can't copy. Um, and that's just happened in the last few months and I see it as a direct result of these kind of large language models and people not wanting to contribute necessarily um, to that. And I think we're gonna see some more institutional changes like that that might actually restrict our access to things that, have, that may remain openly licensed but are just much still somehow less accessible to us. Oh, one thing that I will react to that is uh, I think there's going to be a push towards less open license and more licenses with certain caveats to them. And so there's already uh, open licenses with caveats like rail licenses, if you're familiar with the term. And so I think that people more and more might say, yes, it's open, but no AI. Yes, it's open, but no commercial use. Yes, it's open, but... Uh, yeah, I want, uh, my name, uh, I'm Andrew. My username is Ohana United. So I edit on English and Chinese uh, Wikipedia. And I kind of echo what you said about the, don't forget the other languages, because most of the existing uh, AIs 
for the day are trained on using the English data sets. So whenever you try to ask a question using, say, Spanish, Chinese, uh, French, you would often get a really bad answer or sometimes even incoherent answers. So I was wondering, like, if, like, Per, or maybe you're even just commenting on perhaps for English, the, the, maybe the horse has already left the barn. For the, uh, the other languages, me, maybe we should embrace with those companies because we have seen, like for example, Tencent and Alibaba, those, those are really big Chinese companies. They have thrown billions and billions of dollars. And it turns out when you ask those questions on a Chinese engine using English, you get a better result than asking them in Chinese. So I think we, uh, and definitely for other languages which do not have as much capital uh, involved to invest in these kind of uh, language training. So I was hoping that Wik uh, Wikimedia Foundation could use that as a, and embrace this opportunity to welcome those other languages that have not been uh, as well supported online and on, in the AI. I, I think the only thing I'll add to what you shared is that we haven't talked here about um, what happens on the talk pages if machines enter the talk pages, right? And as we are thinking about adding content to the languages, we should also all keep in mind like basically the challenges of you know conversations on the talk pages and machine entering that conversation and how does the community want to... This can be an excellent segue to the next session. <laughs> Well, uh, one observation that I'd like to add is uh, in terms of working with companies like Tencent and such, uh, we're often limited by who is, n first of all, interested in even talking to us, but moreover interested in talking to us on the terms that we think are important. I think a lot of companies are very, very interested in talking to us in terms of how do we make money mm. with uh, training data, how do we make money with these things, but they're less interested in talking about the things that we want to talk about, which is how do we preserve an open ecosystem for free information, which is not necessarily entirely at odds with what they want, but many of the times it seems to be. Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, very interesting, the, the talk. Uh, uh, we've been talking about um, uh, some fears uh, that services like ChatGPT uh, could uh, replace uh, Wikipedia uh, when, when we talk about new audiences, for example. But I, I, I am curious if there is uh, some research, if that is already uh, happening or not. Because, for example, other platforms, uh, there are um, a lot of reports about, for example, Stack Overflow and, and some others, that this is already happening. So I am curious uh, about if um, the foundation is measuring this, uh, researching about this, or there are some uh, data uh, uh, today. Okay. Oh. Um, sorry, I'm behind you. Um, so in, in terms of research, it, it's, I would say, going slowly right now. However, we are intending to invest some effort to understand how people are engaging with like, you know, the, te the experimental technologies that the foundation is de developing. For example, the ChatGPT plugin for Wikipedia. Uh, so we are going to spend some more effort in, in this space. If you have ideas about some particular things that can be interesting to you or your community, please come and talk with me, Danny, Lydia, I can transfer as well. We have uh, just we, we would be happy to talk. Yeah, we have time for one last question, but uh, we are all, uh, and it's for uh, him. But uh, we are all here afterwards, and we'll be here all weekend to talk about these things. There's also uh, at least two more panels on related topics. One of which is. Uh, happening right after this at 11.15 uh, Singapore time, and then a uh, specific topic uh, uh, talk about uh, languages and how they relate to uh, models. Okay, um, I'm Manok from Thailand, and it's a Thai Wikipedia that, 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 that you mentioned that it's a language that already left out. It's Thai language. You, you cannot have like a chat GPT is very good in Thai, and it's very bad right now. And I feel like Googlebot or Langchain or like a Bing, it's still bad for Thai language. And in the near future, I think like uh, English it get better and better, like a uh, Spanish, but Thai is still not that good enough. Probably like uh, in the future we are already left out again. That's what I want to share. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah.
We're here till they kick us out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, very quickly. Uh, hi, my name is Pilar Sainz. I'm from Wikimedia Colombia, so I'm very glad to be here. But uh, I was thinking about where is the places when the, this regulatory discussion are opening, because uh, some of us are trying to participate, for example, in WIPO, but it's impossible for many of the people from the movement, uh, particularly in those discussions around um, open licenses, for example, or the use of, yeah, so where are these spaces and how we can try to participate as community? That's a really good question. It's probably too much for the time we have left, but the two things that I will say are, number one, through the normal kind of regulatory process. So the EU has the AI Act, so those are the types of things that people who are EU citizens, for example, can engage with. The second thing is engaging on a private grassroots level with these companies because uh, from our limited conversations with them, they are very, very uh, interested in how they look to all of uh, us who are the users of their products and the people who uh, see their brands. And so if someone has a complaint about uh, these products not working in a certain language, if someone has a complaint about uh, these products uh, using certain types of training data that they believe are uh, fundamentally unethical, uh, say something about it, social media. And so I, th be I think they really do pay attention to that stuff. I know it's sort of like a not great answer, and we could talk about the details of it, but I think those are two things that are important. All right, and so thank you, everybody. That's time. Thanks. Really appreciate everybody much. coming, and there's more AI talk in the future. Uh, the two other panels, and AI will be part of your future soon enough. <laughs>